Our next keynote for the day is Professor Alexander Burke. He is Burton Russell, Professor of Philosophy at Cambridge University and a Fellow of St. John's. We're delighted to have him here. It is a pleasure to listen to your talk and I believe it will be titled Interpreting Structure. Um, we're very grateful. We know Professor Bird has a lot of commitments and he's managed to, to squeeze us in the program and has been a, a valiant uh, member of the audience for uh, pretty much all the other talks as well. So thank you for that. Alexander, good to meet you and please take it away. Thanks very much, Andre. And thank you. thanks for your invitation to do this and for putting on such a, a great uh, event. Let me share, see if I can share my screen. Share, that's good. And let's see whether this works. Okay, here we go. Good. Okay. So um, what I need to be doing to, today is to look at three interpretations of the structure of scientific revolutions and see you know, what, what advantages and disadvantages they have as a way of interpreting or possibly reconstructing the ideas of Kuhn in that work. And I'm going to look at Wittgensteinian approach, a Kantian interpretation, and a naturalistic one. Um, as I say, so, yeah, an interpretation is, is trying to tell us really what, what Kuhn was himself thinking uh, when he wrote structure. And reconstruction is, it, it puts more of the, uh, the interpreter's own thoughts in, uh, you know, to, 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 to try and make, as it were, the, the, the work uh, a, a more convincing or fuller uh, philosophical uh, exercise. And that might mean adding to, and possibly even in some cases, uh, going away from uh, what the, the original uh, author intended. Um, uh, what I'm going to be suggesting really is, is I mean, all, all of these have different degrees of interpretation and recon, uh, reconstruction. Um, and I think the naturalistic I'm going to suggest is, is, is the closest to, to uh, Kuhn's original intentions, but for various reasons, you know, e even it is best considered as a reconstruction if we're interested in trying to work out you know, what, what it is that Kuhn was right about. What was, what was he correctly identifying in the nature of, uh, of science? Okay, so um, furthermore, I think that, that the naturalistic interpretation is going enables enables us to recover what's best, I think, about the Wittgenstein and Kantian uh, approaches. Okay, so uh, look at look at Wittgenstein. So Wittgenstein, it's interesting. So I'm mean, picking up on uh, uh, on Adam's talk, right? Yeah. For, for 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 a work that is of such philosophical interest, you know, whether or not it is actually a work of philosophy or entirely you know, a philosophical book or or however you think about it, um, it's really um, very l little is said about any other philosophers, which is sort of un 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 let's just say unusual for, for a work of philosophy. Um, but Wittgenstein is an exception, and right? I think he's the the, the probably the most important philosopher discussed in structure, certainly the one given the most extensive uh, discussion, and consequently a a number of uh, authors have uh, read structure through distinctly uh, Wittgensteinian uh, lenses, and here are uh, some of the those. Um, of these, and in my opinion, the most interesting and Im Im important is, is Vaso Kindi. Um, I, I really admire Vaso's uh, uh, work and it's, I think it's really intellectually uh, insightful. Um, but I'm going to suggest that um, actually there is very little uh, Wittgenstein in, in Kuhn. It's quite specific, um, whereas you read the work of these authors and you know, together they think that you know that there are connections between uh, Wittgenstein and Kuhn uh, covering these things private language theory meaning paradigm concept seeing aspects philosophical quietism forms of life family resemblance all of these are 
are held to be connections between uh, Wittgenstein and uh, and Kuhn. Um, and I'm going to argue that that's uh, actually uh, wrong. Um, and then I'll focus on the bit that really, you know, where there really is a, a, a connection, which is re really to do with the very last of these, the family resemblance idea. And even that has a, a lim only a limited application in Kuhn. Um, so was Kuhn, was Wittgenstein such uh, an important influence on Kuhn? And the simple answer is no. And, and we know that um, because of the existence uh, of a um, almost complete typescript of the structure of scientific revolutions, which Paul Heuning and Huna calls proto uh, structure. Um, so this was produced, I think, just a year or so before uh, structure itself was uh, published. And so you, we, this comes out, yeah, I think this gets circulated in uh, 1961 amongst um, uh, key colleagues of, of Coons. Um, so yeah, this is really close to um, uh, what we get in the following year in the structure of scientific revolutions. Um, we see that in fact there's an almost exact correspondence of the chapters, uh, except that chapter four in protostructure um, it doesn't exist as such in, in, in the final version of structure, where there are in fact uh, two, two chapters. Okay, so to, to chapter four in effect has become two chapters, and that's the bit of the uh, the the bit that has experienced most uh, re, uh, rewriting. And what's striking is that in proto-structure, uh, there is no mention of Wittgenstein. Right. Um, so it's um, really implausible uh, to think that um, it, the structure of scientific revolutions is deeply influenced by, by Wittgenstein, uh, given the fact that Wittgenstein isn't mentioned at all in the almost the, the, the pro, in proto structure, um, but does appear in structure uh, um, a few the final version of structure a few months uh, later. Um, Paul Huna speculates, and I think this is uh, you know, really plausible. Um, that um, what happened was was that when proto structure was circulated, in particular to, to the small num number of other philosophers and, and, and colleagues, including Stanley Cavell, that it was Cavell who pointed out the fact that that Wittgenstein's work on family resemblance might be helpful for solving a problem that uh, Kuhn encounters in. Uh, in chapter four, in chapter four of proto structure, which uh, turns into these two chapters in structure of uh, scientific uh, revolutions. Um, so what we need to do really is is to focus is not to think that all of structure is influenced by 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 by, Kuhn, uh, uh, by, by Wittgenstein, but by focus exactly on wh where uh, Wittgenstein comes into um, this uh, in into structure. And see what problem it is that uh, Wittgenstein's work is thought by Kuhn to, 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 to solve or help him with. Okay, so um, where do we, as I said, we, we've got this single chapter in protostructure, structure, which comes to uh, chapters in, in structure. What's, what's going on in those two chapters? Well, chapter four in structure is about normal science. It's normal science is puzzle solving. So I'm trying to get rid of pictures which are um never mind um actually i'm gonna un un uh okay un oh, no, here we go sorry the pictures of, of me and other people in the way of the the the, the slide okay so um chapter four there is about puzzle solving and it's it says that normal science is rule governed. And look at the original title of that chapter. Normal science is rule determined. So clearly rules play an important part in, in what Kuhn thinks is going on in normal science. Um, 
And you know, this is um, it, this is important for Kuhn because it, puzzle solving is governed by rules. If, for example, rules about what counts as solving a puzzle, as Kuhn, Kuhn reminds us, you know, if you try and squeeze a jigsaw piece, your jigsaw puzzle piece in by uh, by putting the plane side up, turning it upside down, and squeezing it in, uh, that's not a way of solving the the jigsaw. Uh, puzzle of, of completing it properly. Um, that's forbidden by the, the, the rules of the game. Um, it's also the idea of rules is also required to make the analogy between scientific and political revolutions. Um, you know, a revolution is a change not permitted or governed by the existing uh, rules. Um, you know, so just as people uh, can agree on what counts as solving a crossword puzzle, or at least in normal times, on what counts as winning an election, there is agreement on what counts as solving a scientific puzzle. On the other hand, and this is the this is what's going on in in chapter five, is um, when a historian or a philosopher tries to extract these rules, they find it impossible to produce what Kuhn calls a full and explicit or full and explicitly articulated set of. Uh, uh, rules and, and furthermore, the, the rules that there are, insofar they come up with rules, they are you know, full of uh, exceptions. And indeed, it's difficult you, when some philosophers try to articulate rules. There's a disagreement about whether those are really are the the rules. So there's a problem in identifying uh, and it's giving an explicit articulation of uh, uh, the rules, yet people are able to follow the rules and agree on, in almost all cases, what counts as following the, uh, the rules. So, so, so there's a sort of tension here um, that for, for, for Kuhn between the idea that normal science is rule governed, but we can't say what the, what the rules uh, are. Okay, and, and this is where um, Wittgenstein comes in. This is where I think Cavell saw um, that there was this tension in Kuhn and reference to Wittgenstein or family resemblance would uh, resolve that, uh, that tension. Uh, and so, the, I, I mean, the key idea is going to be, is going to be this, that so, uh, an, an activity um, can be rule governed without it being the case that the participants in that activity can fully uh, and explicitly articulate uh, that rules. Of those, uh, those rules. Um, rather, uh, rules, the, the way of going forward, it can be learned by exposure to, to paradigms. And Wittgenstein's uh, remarks on family resemblance and how the concept of game is a family resemblance concept um, is, is supposed to do some, do, does important work, work there. So, so it's a reminder, of course, what's going on in, in Wittgenstein there. Yeah, we look at Exemplar, exemplars of, of games, and we see that you know, perhaps the first two games we look at have a set of features in common, A, B, and C, but they don't have feature D. They're both games. So we might think A, B, and C are necessary and sufficient conditions for something's being a game. We, if we were to give a, articulate the rule for being a game, something is a game if it has, uh, if and uh, it has all of uh, A, B, and, and C, if and only if it has all of A, B, and C. But then we find that we think that gamma activity gamma counts a, a, as a rule, and it doesn't have feature A. So you might think, oh, well, to be a, a, a game has to be a, a, you know, B and C. Those, those are the necessary and sufficient conditions. And we look at um, get, uh, activity delta, and that's a game too. Uh, and it's only got, it doesn't have B and C, it has only C. So we think, okay, perhaps it's just C. C is the key feature of being a game. And we look at activity um, epsilon, but ep which is exactly C, but our, our intuitions are, well, uh, yeah, our, our judgment is that the uh, that our, uh, epsilon is is not a game. Um, so what's going on here? What what are the you know, necessary and sufficient conditions that we would lay down in a set of explicit rules uh, for being a game? Well, we, we, we there are none. There's nothing that we can uh, can do here. Um, there's no set of uh, um, necessary and sufficient 
uh, conditions. So how is it that we get to apply the concept game? Well, it's by exposure to lots of games. We acquire a sense of what counts as similar, uh, similarity, you know, family resemblance amongst um, uh, games. What, what, what kinds and degrees of similarity uh, are required for something to be uh, be a, a game? Um, here's, a, here's an interesting feature of Kuhn's discussion here. He says that it's, Kuhn says it's, this is possible to learn by exposure to examples um, is a way of learning a concept because the concept in question picks out a natural family. If they were not a natural family, then our ability to apply the concept without disagreement would be evidence that there is a set of necessary and sufficient conditions behind our use of it. Um, it's because we're picking out a natural family um, that, that we can do this. Um, now, this claim, uh, and Kuhn himself points this out, is not to be found in Wittgenstein. Um, who says, uh, this is a quote from Kuhn, who says, um, Wittgenstein says, almost nothing about the sort of world necessary to support the naming procedure he outlines. And, and what's curious about this is that Kuhn's argument here indicates a metaphysical realism uh, that yeah, I think shouldn't be overlooked when uh, in trying to interpret what Kuhn was thinking when he wrote uh, 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 Structure. Right, okay. So, um, so there's, yeah, there's no, it's, it's wrong to think that there is no rule for the concept game um, and likewise no rule for being a puzzle solution. That, 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 that's, that's, that's a mistake. Um, what Kuhn is saying and using Wittgenstein to, to, to say is that there is no rule that can be given a full and explicit articulation. Uh, um, <clears throat> The, the rule is you know, uh, uh, make something similar to to, to the model. You have to behave in a way that resembles prior practice. Um, okay, so what's important here is that Kuhn is thinking of family resemblance concepts as a parallel for his view about the rules of science. You know, concepts are rule governed, but that doesn't mean they're governed by explicit rules. They're given governed by rules, given by exposure to, to, to examples. And that's what he thinks is going on in, in normal science. Um, so what's interesting is what Kuhn doesn't uh, here um, think that use the family resemblance concept idea as an account of any kind of scientific concept. Right? So it's, it, it's, 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 it's a, it, it, not using any Wittgensteinian philosophy of language. Uh, here, nor does he adopt any other part of Wittgenstein's philosophy, uh, either in this passage or elsewhere in, in, in structure. Okay, so so I think what we can conclude by that is that there's a very specific use of, but I, I think important use of Wittgenstein uh, in, in in structure, and that it's you know, a mistake to 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 see much more going on uh, than that. Okay. Let's move on to the Kant interpretation. Um, now, Kuhn later on was very explicit in calling himself a, a Kantian or a kind of Kantian, a Kantian with uh, movable uh, categories. Um, so um, I, I, I should say probably really that uh, what I really think is going on here is, yeah, it, why is he thinking of himself as a Kantian when there's no mention of Kant um, uh, in, in structure? And okay, yes, it's true that uh, Kuhn had been exposed to, to, to Kant, but there's very little evidence, I think, that that, that exposure influenced uh, the writing of structure. I think this is a reconstruction that Kuhn liked um, and was, and, and, and he, he adopted, um, thanks to his discussions with Paul Heuning and Huna, who spent a, you know, a year with uh, with Kuhn um, while working on on, on his, his 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 book. And you know, I think that, in a way, um, Heuning and Huna stands to the to Kant, the role of Kant 
in Kuhn as Cavell stands to the role of Wittgenstein, except that you know, Cavell persuaded Kuhn that Wittgenstein was important for a particular, very specific problem that I just referred to, whereas Paul Hunning and Huna uh, persuaded Kuhn that uh, he should be, yeah, that, that, that Kant was a way of looking, you know, not at some specific problem, but as a way of thinking about his whole, whole philosophy. Um, so, so what do we get in? What do we find in 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 Kant? Yeah, yeah is Kant one hundred and one, uh, which is all the Kant I know really. Um, so we 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 divide thing. There is a this important division between the noumena, the things in themselves, and the phenomena, the things that are given intuition. That's to say, sensory uh, experience, um, and. Um, what we what we get there is is an important relationship between these these that um, certain things um, we might call the, the like space and time are sort of a priori concepts imposed upon experience uh, by by the mind. So so the nature of experience is is in some sense a the result of both the things in themselves and uh, and, and the mind uh, as well. So that's so the mind imposing uh, something on what uh, uh, um, comes from the things in themselves. But even that's sort of overstating things because because it's natural to think of that in causal terms. But that would be a mistake because uh, concepts such as cause uh, and substance are categories. Um, <clears throat> which are supposed to be a priori concepts that apply to anything of which we can make an empirical uh, judgment. So it's not quite correct to say uh, that um, we can use this notion of cause outside this framework to describe the relationship between the two parts of it. No, things like cause and substance and space and time all really are, 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 are things that, that describe only what goes on on the left-hand side, the phenomena, the the the. the the way we experience um, uh, things. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the important thing here, though, is that, that in some sense, that's not quite captured by the concept of causation. There is the, the, the intu intuition, sensory experience, is a result of the mind and the things in them, uh, in themselves. Um, um, so what about what about Kuhn? Where does Kuhn, Kuhn come comes in? So so Kuhn says this: um, though the world does not change with a change of paradigm, the scientist afterward works in the in a different world. I'm convinced we must make sen uh, sense of these statements. Yeah. Um, well, if the world doesn't change, um, but it's different. <laughs> Then well, there's got to be two worlds, right? Yeah. If it's changed and different, then we're talking about two two worlds. So we think of in in, in this you know, Heinegger and Huner inspired Kantian interpretation. We think of the world in itself and the phenomenal world, and it's the latter that 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 is in some sense the product of the mind. Now, of course, what makes Kuhn different from Kant is that the relevant features of the mind are themselves uh, changing and they change with a uh, scientific uh, revolution. Now, um, uh, of course, this is an important um, departure from Kant in two respects. Um, First of all, we're no longer dealing with just with the categories. So the categories, as I said, are things like cause and substance, very general, apply to everything. Um, whereas you know, what changes with the scientific revolution are not just um, those aspects of science that deal with these very general things like cause and substance. You know, some bits of scientific change do, I think. Yeah, you know, the quantum revolution and new, even the Newtonian revolution brought changes in possibly in our concepts of cause and substance, or at least how we think about uh, those things. And you know, think in, you know, instantaneous action at a distance in in Newton, or or, or you change in, in how we are supposed to think of of matter uh, uh, and substance in in the quantum revolution. But most scientific revolutions do not concern 
um, changes in these really general features, um, but I think, think changes in things that are much more specific. So it's, it's yeah, the notion of category is being broadened a lot, or at least we're you know, to, to, in a way that is quite unkantian. Uh, un and of course, the other thing is that th this influence of the mind is not fixed, but change, but but changes you know, with scientific uh, revolutions. Okay, so. Um, Now, one, it's, it's, it's sort of, to some extent, it's con controversial you know, to the extent to which you know, the experience, because experience is what's on the left-hand side of this, and it's, experience, it's controversial the extent to which um, um, experience really can be changed by a change of paradigm. I mean, I think it can, I, yeah, I'm really, I think it can, and, and I think that the example of the Brunner and Postman uh, anomalous pain card experiments show that this is the case. Uh, possibly um, uh, some uh, yeah, some Gestalt images do uh, do do this, um, um, and you've got we've got this the example from um, Hansen of the the scientist and the child seeing something different when they see the uh, X ray. I, I, I think it's plausible for some rich notion of experience that the nature of experience is indeed dependent upon conditions um, such as conceptual repertoire or prior exposure to perceptual exemplars, and that these um, include elements of a paradigm that are liable to change in such a way that when um, uh, that a subject's experience does indeed change when uh, a paradigm uh, changes. So I think I think that the idea of a phenomenal world um, you know, that changes uh, when there is a change, a scientific revolution, is entirely uh, plausible if you are a sufficiently liberal-minded uh, uh, Kantian. Um, but there are a couple of problems with the Kantian uh, view. Um, um, one is that um, if this problem I referred to earlier, that, that for Kuhn, unlike Kant, the relationship between you know, the, the, the way that the phenomenal world is affected by what goes on in the mind as a result of scientific revolution is clearly cause, causal. And indeed, is, he thinks it can be explained by science. He thinks that that's the role of psychology is to explain this. Um, that's one, one, one problem. Um, um, but I think a bigger problem is is this. Um, consider the, yeah. So I mean, so so I mean that, that's that that last problem was yeah, this this problem was is Paul Heining and Hooner's uh, worry about um, Kuhn, Kuhn's uh, picture. But uh, as it were, it's, it, he's saying it's going a bit too far um, um, by including. Too much in the phenomenal world, and it, it sort of threatens itself. Um, whereas my own complaint is that it doesn't really go far enough, in that this focuses too much on experience. You know, this, this, this is you're on the left hand side. That's too much focusing on the experience on, on sensory experience. Um, so take take um, the chemical revolution, uh, phlogiston. Theory gave way to Dawson theory. Um, um, so Kuhn, um, so Priestley is often named as the discoverer um, of uh, oxygen, since he um, he was first isolated oxygen gas. Um, this is problematic, says Kuhn, because Priestley saw oxygen uh, as deflagesticated air. Um, so. Yeah, the sense in which you, Kuhn is trying, I think Kuhn is trying to make a point about the complex nature of discovery, not about perception. So the following thoughts are not, it's not supposed to be criticism of Kuhn as such. But the question nonetheless is, is there any literal sense in which Priestley, on looking at a bell jar containing oxygen, saw something different from Lavoisier? Yeah, when uh, Lavoisier saw the gas as oxygen and Priestley saw it as deflagisticated air, is there any plausible sense in which they had a different 
uh, experience. Now, I think that, that, that I just don't, yeah, I simply do not buy that, that, that there's any sensible way in saying that either of them had a different, um, a different experience. Um, so yeah, even again, going, going back, say, to the, is this on the next slide? Yeah, the X-ray tube um, that, that, that Hansen describes. Is it the case that the child and the, uh, the, the scientist uh, have a different kind of experience on uh, on on looking at uh, at this well i think that that, that that there is and that's because the, the scientist is able to do it's able to do things that the child can't uh, the scientist is able immediately to distinguish the x-ray tube from other pieces of in in the of equipment in the laboratory that look superficially similar such as a cathode ray tube um, the scientist is able, um, able to distinguish parts of the uh, X-ray tube and, and he knows what they do, um, knows you know, the difference between the two um, electrodes. Um, understand, he understands or she understands that the glass tube is evacuated you know, and that this patch on it is coated with phosphorus paint and so on. So there's a lot. Yeah, if, 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 if there was a broken part, it, she'd be able to recognize this. Um, yeah, but none of this is true in the um, in, in 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 this case. Yeah, um, there's an obvious sense in which a jar of oxygen looks just like a jar of nitrogen, and which just looks like a jar of ordinary air, or indeed uh, one with a vacuum in it. No amount of experience or information about the gases will allow one to tell uh, which is which is which. Thus, yeah, Priestley and Wazi actually have the same perceptual experience. OK, even if, thanks to knowing its provident, provenance, uh, one sees the gas as dephlogisticated air and the other one as oxygen. So the point here is not so much to you know, draw a strict line concerning the meaning of experience and perception, but it's just to point out that um, this, it's it, the idea of world change as, as change in the phenomena, change in the subject's experience is simply too narrow to capture the full range of the cognitive changes that are consequent on paradigm change. Um, it, it, basically, I'm really saying that despite you know, Kant's uh, rationalist antecedents, he's, he, he's far too empiricist. Um, you know, Unless one is really an out and out card carrying empiricist, you know, empiricist such as you know, logical positivist, it's simply too narrow a basis for characterizing the cognitive processes of uh, of science. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now is suggest that the, uh, some, we we can do we can do we can do better. Um, so um, we want to try and make sense of the talk of. Um, world change, but I don't think we have to do so in a metaphysically literal way. Um, Kuhn says such things like this. We may want to say that after a revolution, scientists are responding to a different world. Note what chapter 10 is called. Uh, it's called um, Revolutions as Changes of World View. It's not called Revolutions as Changes of World. Um, so I think one can read structure without any problem while taking talk of the scientist's world as a façon de parler of a kind it's entirely common amongst English speakers. Um, my world is different from your world, the world of the artist is different from the world of the scientist, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, without committing oneself to any kind of, you know, sort of metaphysical sort of pluralism of, 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 of worlds. Um, but, um, I mean, Kuhn has a, has a problem. He says, I am a, I am a, I'm acutely aware of the difficulties created by saying that when Aristotle and Galileo looked at swinging stones, the first saw constrained fall and the second uh, uh, a pendulum. The same difficulties are presented in an even more fundamental form by the opening sentences of this section. Though the world does not change with the change of paradigm, the scientist afterward works in a different world. Nonetheless, I'm convinced that we must learn to make sense of statements that at least resemble these. What occurs during a scientific revolution is not fully reducible to or a reinterpretation of individual and stable data. In the first place, the data are not unequivocally stable. Rather than being an interpreter, 
The scientist who embraces a new paradigm is like a man wearing inverting lenses, confronting the same constellation of objects as before and knowing that he does so, but he nonetheless finds them transformed through and through in their many details. Okay, so what Kuhn is here trying to avoid is this familiar empiricist model that there is a fixed uh, observational uh, basis, a stable bedrock of uh, science, you know, from which you know, perhaps using rules of confirmation, uh, scientific me me you know, method or whatever, we, we, we get to make some inferences about the truth or correctness or probability of some, uh, uh, some theory. Okay. Um, so what's clear for Kuhn is that there is a significant psychological shift accompanying a revolution um, for which you know, simply a change of preferred theory is not enough. Um, you know, simply changing a theory is, is not not always psychologically very significant. Uh, in terms of this you know, model, you just deduce, if, as you, if you're using hypothetical deductive method, for example, you just deduce your, your claims from L2 instead of L, L1. I think the Aristotle experience is playing a, uh, a role uh, here. Um, um, you know, you'll remember um, in coming, you know, after immersion in Aristotle's work to, you know, um, he, he came to see Aristotle as a great scientist, whereas he before he couldn't see while, uh, uh, why Aristotle was so considered. Uh, Kuhn himself underwent a kind of psychological change, a sort of um, yeah, personal solo scientific revolution in reverse. Um, but this is inexplicable on the empiricist uh, model. But the problem for Kuhn is, um, I mean, so, 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 so I mean, what Kuhn does want to do is that he turns to to, to the psychological evidence to, to to help him. And the Brunner and Postman experiments and the Gestalt psychologists, you tell him that the, the, the perceptual experience is not a fixed given. That bottom line is not a is not fixed. Um, but can be molded by prior experience. And, but the problem for Kuhn is, and I think he recognizes this in the passages uh, passage I quoted, is that this only gets him so far. There are cases where a change in perceptual experience is important, um, part of what changes, but it's you know, a great stretch to say that the key difference between Priestley and Lavoisier is that a flask of colorless gas looks different. Likewise, the, the difference between Newtonian and relativistic phys physics. Um, okay, so um, so yeah, I, what I think saying is that, that Kuhn is pushing towards more so getting psychology in here, but the only psychology he can he can get hold of is um, perceptual psychology. But he needs more than that. Um, Kuhn, after the passage about Aristotle and Galileo mentioned, uh, he goes on to say this, what data did the interaction of the, their different paradigms and their common environment make accessible to each of them? Seeing constrained fall, the Aristotelian would measure, or at least discuss, the Aristotelian cells and measured, the weight of the stone, the vertical height to which it had been raised, and the time for which it took to, to achieve rest. Together with the resistance of the, of the medium, these were the conceptual categories deployed by Aristotelian science when dealing with a falling body. Normal science, normal, normal research guided by them could not have produced uh, the laws that Galileo discovered. Um, so what I think is significant here is that Kuhn doesn't simply tell us that somehow the swinging stone looks different to Aristotle. Rather, seeing the swinging stone disposes Aristotle to do, or the Aristotelian, uh, to do and think things that Galileo is not disposed to do or think. So, um, so that, yeah, it's not just there that we need to focus our interest. It's it's, it's on 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 different dispositions that, that that the scientists have. Okay, so spiders. Uh, many people are instinctively uh, afraid of uh, of spiders. There's, for them, there's this immediate sort of. Uh, um, Cognitive move from seeing a spider to to to, to fear, uh, and anxiety, a sense of danger. Um, uh, yeah, that's intuitive for some people. Um, but for some other people, 
um, they come to learn that sp spiders are dangerous. Um, so it's, it's, it's inferential. Of course, you might in internalize uh, that connection between spiders and danger. Perhaps you know, only one or two bites from a, a venomous spider um, could teach someone to react to spiders um, in the same way that an instinctively fearful person reacts to them. Or someone, in another case, someone might learn, start, have a theory that they apply. A spider with a red dot on its back is venomous and make inferences about the spiders that she, she sees and that, that they are dangerous. This is purely inferential on the basis of the theory. But of course, if you see enough of them, this inference becomes second nature. And they too immediately react to seeing the spider in, in a way um, that the others uh, do. The instinctively fearful person, the person who's been bitten a few times, they, they all you know, you see now see the spider and then react to it with, with, with fear, anxiety, your sense, sense of uh, uh, danger. In some, you know, one case it's instinctive, in the other two cases it's a learned response, albeit in two, you know, come about in two different ways. For them, it's, it's a quasi instinctive. So what I'm thinking is that what is that the Aristotelian reaction to the swinging stone is 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 like this: training and repeated exposure with the problems of Aristotelian science will make certain responses immediate, intuitive, quasi intuitive when the Aristotelian sees the swinging stone. See that, yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, we, so for example, what do you think like that you, when you see that, right? Well, um, you, many physicists, um, you will see that and think, oh, simple harmonic motion. They just know that that is you, the equation which you, when you solve it, gives you, uh, gives you simple harmonic motion. Um, um, you, they, obviously, they must have learned that at some point, and it, you, but now it becomes a natural, uh, natural inference. You, these are things you know, that I think for many people, all these scientists, either now or in the past, you would would have been like that. You make these natural connections between between concepts and ideas, natural dispositions to to respond. Um, you know, you, mitochondria. I say mitochondria. Well, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a biologist will think, oh, well, that's that, that's the means of energy production, ATP, and all that sort of thing. Um, now, of course, it, sometimes these connections you know, are, are forged by experience, but can be mistaken, right? So you think reptile, cold-blooded dinosaurs. They're big reptiles. They must be cold-blooded. Oh, then, but then, then you discover that that the birds are are are. are, are are dinosaurs too, or descended from them, and they, but they're warm-blooded. So they, they, we, there's 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 some cognitive cognitive dissonance dissonance uh, there, um, or we make a natural connection between waves and vibrations. And so you think, oh, therefore um, light is a vibration in electromagnetic uh, ether, and and, and we uh, yeah, as a result of you know, uh, um, what we learn from Maxwell. Um, Again, that's that that's a mistake. So when you when we get um, results like the uh, Michelson Morley experiments, we 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 find that's you know, again a sort of a sort of cognitive dissonance. So what's going on in all these cases is that we're making these you know, quasi intuitive uh, connections, but they're amongst concepts. They, they they it's it's like seeing the spider as dangerous, um, uh, like seeing the um, yeah. X-ray tube is certain uh, 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 as uh, uh, as an X-ray tube as having certain features uh, uh, to it, but it's but these cases are non non perceptual. Now the, the what what I think is going on really is that Kuhn was reaching for some ideas that we we find in contemporary cognitive uh, science, but simply weren't available to um, to Kuhn where. It, the relevant research in psychology was all in the area of um, um, perceptual psychology. But since then, we've got you know, lots of works on frames, schemas, biases, and heuristics. Um, a lot more work on, on classical conditioning and how, how, how that's, uh, yeah, we get that in neural network and connectionist models, I work on pattern, pattern recognition and, and, and the rest of it. And it's these are the things that uh, can explain how there can be uh, how it is that exposure to, to, to paradigms can have a, an effect on our thinking that's not an effect just on our, our set of perceptual experiences. Um, so we so this can incorporate the Kantian uh, uh, view, um, but but move beyond it. And for the same reason, I think it you know, 
it can also you know, incorporate the Wittgensteinian thing because it's just talking about what, you, what we learn by it's generalizing this idea of what we, what it is that we learn by exposure to uh, to uh, uh, examples. Right, I've taken up far too much time, um, so I I will stop. So in case anybody has an interesting question. Thanks so much to Professor Bird, and um, it was quite a thought-provoking uh, okay. um, Please join me in applauding his work. Next, we move to Q&A. If uh, anyone has a question or a comment, please don't hesitate to, to bring it up. If I may, let me... Uh, uh, break the ice here again by, uh, uh, I mean, one initial suggestion might be that uh, uh, um, the cognitive scientific um, underpinnings of how the Kantian and the Wittgensteinian interpretation of Kuhn might be integrated um, could be, um, I mean, some questions could be raised about it, not uh, in order to undermine that project, but to uh, flesh it out further. Um, and so naturally, uh, I'd like to ask if uh, you've listed the uh, quasi-intuitive links uh, on your last slide. And um, uh, some of those seem closer to experimental and observational science, for instance, pattern recognition, uh, or the use of some heuristics. And it's not fully clear to me that um, these uh, cognitive scientific developments speak to uh, uh, the higher reaches of uh, theoretical principles, so to speak. Uh, so uh, this is not by way of an objection. I'm just wondering exactly which resources in the COG side to, to deploy here. And so, um, Naturally, I'm wondering if you think that uh, um, enough has been uh, done by way of integrating the Kantian and Wittgensteinian readings, or if simply we should choose the uh, naturalistic one as more plausible, simplicity. Okay, thanks very much, Andre. Yeah, excellent question. I think I think there are two two elements to to that really. What one is to say that I think that it's absolutely right that what one should do is. I was only just hinting at it at, at the end, no more than that. Um, try and integrate all, all, all three or bring the um, Wittgensteinian and Kantian ways of thinking under the uh, more naturalistic um, approach. So I think that's exactly right. So I'm not you rejecting them so much as saying you know, that what, what they get right can be incorporated or explained by the, this naturalistic approach. But the other thing that you were saying was you know, which of you know, if indeed if any of these developments in cognitive psychology really are ones that are helpful for us to understand science because you know, your science is rather it's quite a sophisticated thing and you know, some of these things that you don't these other things don't, don't seem to be relevant to it uh, not not obviously I, I think that that's um that's correct um um, there has been some work, and I think there needs to be more work, but it's, uh, my view, most in interestingly, work done by uh, Kevin uh, Dunbar um, um, on, on how scientists you know, he really he tries to, to work out how scientists actually think. And he's in particular interested in, in how scientists use um, use models and uh, analogies in in their thinking, and he has you know, has done done interesting and important work on that. And that I think that speaks directly to you know, how paradigms you know, influence um, exposure to paradigms, exemplars. The paradigm is exemplar which you 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 are exposed and, and and learn your science. Um, it speaks directly to how, how how that that works. But so I think there's much more to be done. But I, I think that there is there have been important. Uh, steps in the right right direction. Thanks so much for that. And I give way to Professor Patton for a new question. Would you please go ahead? Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, I enjoyed the talk very much. And I, I just wanted to um, uh, 
So first of all, <laughs> I actually entirely support the idea that that the Kantian reading is um, uh, has potentially some weaknesses of structure because um, I was I was uh, um, I've I've done a little bit of work on so I'll be obnoxious and mention my <laughs> I've done a little bit of work on on uh, on uh, Kuhn's Kantian dimensions right I was asked to write a paper about that and when I looked it up. I realized like there's actually quite a bit of evidence that that Kuhn um he had studied Kant with Raphael Demos at Harvard Sorry. um but according to Peter Gallison he had a diary right where he wrote down uh what he had read the books that he had read and the and and of course again um there's a there's a paper by Gallison that I looked at I can look it back up but he said that um Kuhn had actually according to this had not really read um, the critique of pure reason before coming up with structure. And I found that, you know, actually the influence of Piaget was a lot more, you know, people talk about um, gestalt theory, but um, Piaget talks about the acquisition of concepts by children and the way that children learn about space and time and motion and so forth. And I feel like that influence has often not really been um, traced out uh, as well. Like, Um, so I would just say, first of all, I totally, uh, I, I I totally support the idea that that um, that Kant is actually much less in influential than we thought um, on structure, and that this was maybe something that came in afterward. Um, but I wonder what you think about uh, the naturalistic approach as beginning in psychology, um, in it rather than in necessarily a, a sort of philosophical approach, or what you think about that. Thank you. That, that's extremely helpful, actually, and and I will follow that up. I, I, I good, good. I think, look, uh, yes, I think Piaget is interesting, and I think that that that's something I don't know enough about in terms of what the Kuhn connection is, and so so I'll have to 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 to, to you, 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 use you uh, and your work. Um, but absolutely, I think I I I think it's, it's naturalistic through and through in the sense that that that, but but not in the sense of Kuhn thinking I'm a naturalistic philosopher, but rather Kuhn acting as a as as a naturalistic philosopher before you know, people talked about naturalism in philosophy because this is before you coin know, a natural epistemology naturalized and so forth. So I think that. That's right. I mean, he just read. He was he he it was a Booner and Postman was were, were, were you know, Harvard colleagues. Um, he was just interested in psychology and clearly clearly read it. And I just thought he, I think he's he as as a scientist as in some sense as a scientist he reached for what he thought would help him understand the way scientists think, and that was you know, the, the the what psychology you know, what what limited psychology there was. And that that includes Piaget seems entirely sensible and and, and, and relevant. So that yeah, that's that's just grist to the mill. So I will thank you, thank you, Lydia. I will I will own up on my. Uh, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll put you in there. Put, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're in. I don't. That's great. I don't know much about Piaget either, but there are uh, people who do. So that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But it, but but my my limited knowledge says, says, says suggests that that's exactly the kind of thing that, that would be relevant to this kind of uh, 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 approach um you know, the, you know the, the child's acquisition of of of, of concepts you know, is clearly not a matter of uh, of just acquiring a set of theoretical beliefs just despite you know, the child as scientist hypothesis no it's the other way around yeah it's yeah that, that the child engages in certain practices and gets exposed to certain things and that's what the scientist happens to the scientist yeah, and just just super quickly that that uh, thank you um, that he has a discussion with uh, Alexander Coiré about this about Piaget and so it, it's just very brief but he mentions this in it uh, so I can send all of it but it's yeah um, so it, it does seem to be something that's um, at least somewhat influential on on his understanding of scientists' acquisition of concepts. Brilliant, thanks. Thank you. And this is absolutely amazing and not not to sound a skeptical note because that's uh, not in my nature but um 
the debates between uh, Chomsky and then connectionists about concepts to follow, all of them criticizing Piaget, I, I wonder if that's a step forward or if it would be grist for the Kantian's mill. Uh, I just don't know. Um, but it's, uh, these are fascinating issues. And I very much hope that um, more of cognitive science will be brought to bear on uh, a uh, philosophical take of uh, uh, scientific concepts understood in their historical development. All right, thanks so much. Um, if there are some more questions, comments, rejoinders, well, just, just while while people are thinking, there's one last comment comment on 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 what you just said, Andre, and 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 indeed what Lydia was saying. Um, so as, as we're all aware, but most of us haven't seen, and that includes me. You, um, Kuhn was working on a, on a book towards the end of his life, in which developmental psychology was played a significant part, and <laughs> and unfortunately. It hasn't been you know, given to the world to see. I think you have to go to to to, to Chicago and you know sign your life away, and then you can see it. But that's um... but yeah that, that 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 theme didn't leave. That that came back towards the end. In fact, that sounds like a very attractive project. But... It is coming well, you, out. Did, it is coming out, a... by the way. Ah, oh, it yeah, is. It's... The book is coming out. Yeah, I mean, the unpublished manuscript with some editorial apparatus. So, um... Oh, late wow. no, late yeah, November, for the University of Chicago Press. So. <laughs> That's wonderful news. Can't wait to read it. And on that note, please join me in thanking Professor Burke. Thank you. Sir.